السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آئی ایم احمد ممتاز مستحسن ود دا سیکنڈ لیکچر آن سی ایس سی ون فور ون انٹروڈکشن ٹو کمپیوٹر پروگرامنگ آئی ہوپ یو ہیو گون تھرو دا فرسٹ لیکچر اینڈ فاؤنڈ اٹ کنوینئنٹ ایف یو ہیو اینی کویری اینی کویشچن پلیز کانٹیکٹ اس تھرو دی کورس پورٹل ٹوڈے آئی ول کنٹینیو with the fundamentals of the computer concepts. My lecture will be in two parts. The first part will be the fundamentals of the computer concepts and then I will start with the introduction to programming languages. I have decided to quickly start uh, the concepts of the computer programming but just don't worry. I will not miss out any concept that you will require for this particular course regarding computers, the buzzwords, the concepts and the terminology. Today I'll be focusing on the terminologies being used by the IT professionals, teachers, students and computer vendors. It's important for you to know all these terminologies so that suppose if you are required to purchase a computer you should be knowing the basic components and basic specification of the machine. I've also decided that I will be discussing these fundamentals of the computer concepts in my different lectures as fill in the blanks anywhere if I could find some space so I will come up with few concepts so side by side our computer programming learning we would be able to learn the fundamentals of the computers concepts because that is the also part of this course <coughs> I've already given you the references the reference books there are some additional references for this particular lecture I have picked up some material from Programming Languages and Methodologies and this book I have already mentioned in the reference. Then I have picked up some material from the website Wikipedia, a very popular website where you can find the definition of any concept. And then the third one is you can see here www.sliprebreak.com so let's start lesson for the lecture number two. You remember we talked about the memory, memory of the computer and I said that the memory of the computer is the workspace, is the archiving space, is the storage space and then we have, we had categorized the memory of the computer into two parts volatile memory and non-volatile memory and you know that the volatile memory requires power so it loses its contents when the power is switched off whereas the non-volatile memory does not require the power all the time to maintain its contents so the volatile memory we call it as a RAM and non-volatile memory we call it as a ROM so let's go into the further details of the RAM. You might have heard the word DRAM and SRAM. Basically DRAM stands for dynamic RAM. This dynamic RAM is used in the main memory of the computer. This is slower, slower, slower with respect to static RAM okay the data which is stored in the DRAM requires to be refreshed periodically so after a fraction of a second within a fraction of a second you are required to refresh the contents of the RAM it consumes more power once again more power 
with respect to statigram less desirable and cheap with respect to statigram so basically we <coughs> compare apple to apple comparison when we say dynamic ram or dram its apple to apple comparison is with the static ram so the static ram is used in the cache memory i'll explain it to you what is cache memory in few minutes time it is faster than the dynamic ram and the data does not require to be refreshed as i said in the dynamic ram within a fraction of a second you are required to refresh the data but for the static ram you are not required to refresh the data data remains there it is static that's why we call it as a static ram it consumes less power obviously it's more desirable than the dynamic ram due to this features and anything which has more requirement is expensive so it is expensive with respect to the dynamic ram <coughs> memory modules same dim and ram same stands for single inline memory module it contains 72 pins and it transfers the data information over a 32 bit data path called the bus i'll explain it in the next slide but just i would like to show what is sim so on the top of over <coughs> slide you can see a sim and these are the pins these are 72 pins and these for these 72 pins the data is transferred over a channel over a bus which is a 32 bit data path yeah 32 bit bus then we have a dual inline memory module called dim now the numbers of pins are 168 to 184 and it transfers the data on a wider data path that is 64 bit data path so once again if you see a dim it has got the pins on both side this side as well as on the opposite side of this dim which are basically which basically provide the path for the data transfer obviously it has got a wider data path double the strength of the data path or width of the data path of the sim therefore it is faster than the sim then come rim r i m m robust inline memory module 184 pin but it transfers information over a 16 bit data path it occupies less space and hence it is sometime preferred over dim or sim so once again you can see these are the connectors or these are the data path let's talk about the cache memory people used to call it as cache memory cache memory but now the word c a c h e has settled its pronunciation and it is called cache memory be careful its spelling is c a c h e cache memory it's a very high speed memory very expensive therefore it's smaller in the quantity as computer as compared to the memory of the computer as compared to the ram available into the computer usually with a memory cycle time comparable to the time required by a cpu to fetch one instruction i hope you remember 
the last lecture in which we talked about the operations of CPU. Do you remember that? Yes. Fetch, decode, execute, and store the result. So, this fetch requires the time and the time is basically the card, the memory cycle time which is compared to the time required by the CPU to fetch the instruction. This is within the cache memory is usually within the CPU, part and parcel of the CPU. So within the microprocessor, but sometime it is not within the microprocessor. I'll explain it to you when I discuss the different level of cache memory. So the most frequently used instructions are kept in the cache memory of the CPU. So that saves time. It is just like a shopkeeper maintains more frequent item in the shop whereas a less frequent items required by the customers are kept in the warehouse. So this is the smaller storage available within the CPU. So the instructions which are frequently used by the CPU are kept within the cache memory. So the time required to fetch the instruction from the memory to the CPU is much less because the instruction is already available within the CPU. So as I said, okay, it, is, it can be located on microprocessor chip or on a separate chip next to CPU, physically connected with the CPU. Three levels of cache, one is called L1, primary or internal cache, located directly on the processor chip. And as I said, if it is within the chip, it is synchronized with the CPU, runs at the same speed as the CPU. Obviously, it is on a very luxurious place. Within the CPU is a very, very luxurious place. Therefore, its size is very small. L2 cache, secondary or external cache, located directly onto the microprocessor chip or adjacent chip, runs almost at the same speed. It's larger in the capacity at the cost of speed, slightly slower than the L1 cache and its capacity can be increased. That's why it's the capacity of the L2 cache is usually higher than the capacity of the L1 cache. Then we have got L3 cache memory, part of the system's motherboard. As I said that it is located on the motherboard but has a physical connection, a faster bus, a faster data path from the CPU to the uh, memory and memory to the CPU. This L3 cache is present in a high performance systems like servers. So it has got the larger capacity than L2 and L1 cache. So it is a mistake on the slide. The larger capacity than L2 but slower than, obviously it's slower than L2. And uh, it is, if it is larger than L2 then obviously it is larger than L1 also. But the speed is slightly slower than the cache of the L2 category. So we have discussed the types and the terminologies <coughs> of the RAM, which is a volatile memory. Let us talk about the types of the ROM. ROM maintains the data. It is the information which is permanent, permanently stored 
onto the chip. ROM stands for read-only memory. We have got PROM also. PROM is programmable read-only memory. Then we have EEPROM, erasable programmable read-only memory. And finally, we have got double EEPROM, electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. Let's go through it very quickly. ROM, read-only memory, contains the information which is called firmware. Remember, we have talked about hardware. We have talked about software. Now, a new terminology, which is called firmware. Firmware, the definition of the firmware could be information permanent, permanently stored on a chip is called a firmware. Usually, this information is provided by the manufacturer. So, at the time of the manufacturing of this chip, the information is stored, the data is written, and this data cannot be erased or rewritten on the by the user. Next, we have got programmable ROM, programmable read-only memory. This programmable read-only memory is available for the user to develop certain software, certain information, certain program and then load it onto the chip and insert it onto the motherboard of the computer. But it is one time programmable. Information once written onto the prompt cannot be erased. So depending upon the technology, prompt can be programmed at final stage means once you have developed your program, debugged your program, tested your program, and you are 100% sure that it is working, it is operational, it is providing the service, you expect and desire from it, then you burn this program onto the prom. Writing the program, we use sometimes a terminology, burn the program, because it has got the cells. When we write information onto these cells, we burn these cells so that the information is permanently saved onto these cells. Then comes EEPROM, a raisable programmable read-only memory. The difference between PROM and EEPROM is, PROM you can write once, but with EEPROM you can write multiple times you can erase it multiple times and still you can use it. But in order to erase the information that you have saved, you are required an ultraviolet box. A box having an ultraviolet light in it, you can place the EEPROM within the ultraviolet box. It has got uh, a window and uh, that you are required to take the chip out, put it into a, the ultraviolet box, and then erase it, reprogram it, insert it. We used to erase EEPROMs in old days with the help of tube light. We used to stick this EEPROM with a tape at the, the uh, rod of the tube light with a tape. Usually the ultraviolet box takes uh, 10 to 15 minutes to erase the data, whereas if you stick it with the rod of the tube light, it will take one day to erase the data. But it has almost been observated now. Okay, next is electrically erasable programmable PROM. EE PROM. Electrically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. This is the latest and most commonly used ROM. User can modify the contents of the data without taking it out of the socket. While staying within the socket, you can use it, you can program it, you can erase the contents, 
using the programs that can generate electric pulses that can erase the data and then you can rewrite it and the extension of this WE prom is the flash memory and this is the concept based upon the WE prom electrically erasable programmable read only memory with this technology we have built up USB flash drives that you use to transport your data from one computer to the other computer and the same technology is applied at the memory cards used in your mobile phone on the camera and some other devices which require the data to save within the device. I've picked up this beautiful picture from uh, the website for which I have given you the link. Next is CMOS memory. BIOS memory. BIOS kete basic input output system. This is small memory on the PC motherboard that is used to store BIOS setting. Basic input output settings. For example, the clock, the time clock, calendar, date and time that is saved in this CMOS, saved in BIOS memory, having a technology called CMOS technology. So traditionally, it is providing the RAM, but this RAM is not volatile it contains the information then it picks up the power from the battery usually we provide a cell or a battery attached on the motherboard so it draw the power from that cell and that battery because it is a RAM the technology is metal oxide semiconductor so CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor it is SRAM which is powered by a small battery to retain the information it stores configuration information about the computer what type of information for example what is the type of the hard disk what is the category of the hard disk? Similarly, some features regarding uh, the fan speed of your laptop, the power consumption, the mode in which you want to use your processor installed on your computer. So these type of basic information are stored in the CMOS. Okay, let us now Put the things together the concept that we have learned up till now we just would like to put it together processing we said it requires input the data is loaded into the CPU where it is processed and then the processed data that is the output of the computer is recorded into the and then it is transferred to the output devices. So how does it work? We have discussed input devices, central processing unit, CPU, memory, output devices. All these devices are connected together through a channel, through a path, which is called a bus. This bus provides a path to these components to exchange the data among them. For example, the, if the data is required to be loaded into the CPU, it will first we load it from the input device to the memory and then from the memory 
it is loaded onto the CPU where we call it as fetch. Fetch the instruction means load the instruction from the memory to the CPU. Then it is decoded, it is executed, and the output is stored back into the memory of the computer. And from memory of the computer, it goes to the output device, and then it is provided to the user. So the new concept that we have added is the channel path, or we call it as bus. There are different characteristics of the bus. We have a control bus, we have a data bus, but all these technical detail, details you will study in your advanced course like uh, computer architecture or in the operating system. Data flow for a computer job. First of all, the data flows from the input device into the memory of the computer. As you see in the slide, The input data is transferred from the input device to the memory. Then, step number two, from the main memory of the computer, it is transferred into the center processing unit. Then the center processing unit execute the instructions and write it back into the main memory. And finally, from the main memory of the computer, the data is transferred into the output devices. Step B and C, usually repeated many times. That is, CPU brings the data into the register for processing and then the CPU sends the process data back into the memory. Why we require it many a times? It depends upon the data, it depends upon the instruction cycle, it depends upon the instruction, how many machine cycle an instruction takes, and how much data you are required to put in or take out from the CPU. And again, these concepts you will learn in some advanced course. <coughs> Okay, finally, we start the programming language. Whatever the concepts we have discussed up to now are the basic fundamental concepts of the computer science and IT. As I promised you in the beginning, please don't worry. At any time, any concept is required to be explained, I'll explain it in detail. And while I'll be discussing or delivering different lectures, I'll be coming back with the fundamentals of the concepts. So, since I wanted to start the programming very quickly, so I've decided to just introduce you today what is a programming language. A programming language is a notational system intended primarily to facilitate human and machine. A notation which is understood by the human being as well as by the machine. That's why they can communicate. If you want to communicate with a Chinese who doesn't know English, and you are talking in English, or if you are talking in Urdu, he will not be able to understand that. So in, a, in order to communicate in a language among two parties, the, both the parties should know the language. So any language or any notation used by the language should be understood both by the computer as well as by the human being. A programming language has a syntax 
and language elements have semantics. What is syntax? For every language, there is a grammar. And in a grammar, there are certain rules, certain procedures, certain protocols. And these rules, regulation, procedures, protocol is called a syntax of the language. The syntax of the language elements. I'll come back later on, but are the language elements. But you can say that any rule and regulation comes under the syntax of the language. Semantics, the meaning of these rules and regulation, interpretation of these rules and regulation, but very well defined and very well understood. A constitution ka koi ayin ki koi shik nahi hai jiske liye aapko Supreme Court jana pade uski interpretation ke liye. It's very well defined and very well understood both by the human being and by the computer. So let us define program. Aapko yaad hoga, I have defined a program as a set of instructions. Set of instructions given to the computer what to do and how to do it. Today I defined a program in terms of the programming language. A program is something that is produced using a programming language. Obviously, if you are instructing a computer, you must be instructing a computer in a language understood by the computer. You cannot mix and match two languages to instruct a computer. First of all, you will select a language. Whatever the language you will select, then you will follow the syntax and you will follow the grammar, rules and regulation, and then you will instruct the computer what to do. So a program is something that is produced using a programming language. So a program is structured entity with semantics. Why? Because the structure is under follow certain syntax and that syntax is understood. That syntax has already got certain meaning, certain semantics. So it is convenient and it is easy for both the parties to communicate with each other. So what is programming? A concept which is discussed each and every place. Someone says programming is a science. Some says no, programming is an art. Some say programming is uh, an engineering. Programming is a skill. Don't worry. We say, yes, programming is everything. Why? We say programming is a science because it implements the algorithms described by mathematics and science. Algorithms, I'll come back to it later on. For the time being, I will just say algorithm is a procedure a mathematical model, the solution to a particular problem described mathematically or described in any language, described in steps. So using the programming techniques, you implement the algorithms described by mathematics and science. Therefore, we can say, yes, programming is a science. It's, it's a skill also because it requires design efforts. Craftsmen ko craft banane ke liye skill chahiye hoti. So, programming ke liye aapko programming ki skills aani chahiye. <coughs> Tabhi aap 
ایک اچھا ڈیزائن کر سکتے ہیں پروگرام کو سو اٹ ریکوائر ڈیزائننگ ڈیزائن ایفرٹس دیر فور وی کین سے اٹ از اے اسکل انجینئرس یوزلی ڈونٹ ڈونٹ اگری سو وی سے یس وی کین کال پروگرامنگ ایز این انجینئرنگ بیکاز اٹ از اے ٹریڈ آف آف فور کمپوننٹس وٹ آر دوز فور کمپوننٹس پروگرام سائز اسپیڈ ان وچ اے پروگرام شوڈ بی ایگزیکیوٹیڈ ٹائم ریکوائر ٹو ڈیولپ اینڈ ڈی بگ ڈیٹ پروگرام اینڈ فائنلی مینٹینیبلٹی فیوچر مینٹیننس ایسا نہیں ہے کہ آپ نے پروگرام بنا دیا اور بس اٹ از لائف لانگ یو آر ریکوائر ٹو اپ ڈیٹ دا پروگرام یو آر ریکوائر ٹو مینٹین دا پروگرام مینٹیننس کرنی سو بیسیکلی یو مائٹ لائک ٹو رائٹ اے پروگرام وچ از ویری فاسٹ ویری کوئک بٹ ڈیٹ ول ریکوائر لاٹ آف اسپیس سو یو نیڈ ٹو کمپرومائز یو نیڈ ٹو کمپرومائز ود دا اسپیس سو یو سی اوکے آئی ہیو گاٹ دس مائی اسپیس مائی پروگرام شوڈ بی فٹ ان ود ان دی گیون اسپیس سو دیر از اے ٹریڈ آف ناؤ سو یو ہیو ٹو کنسیڈر دی سائز آف دا میموری اویلیبل ان وچ یور پروگرام شوڈ بی لوڈیڈ دین یو ہیو ٹو کمپرومائز وتھ وتھ اسپیڈ آف دا پروگرام سملرلی دا ٹائم ریکوائر ٹو ڈیولپ اے پروگرام یو مائی ٹرائٹ اے پروگرام وچ از ویری پروفیشنل بٹ اٹ ریکوائر ٹائم ٹو ڈیولپ اے ویری پروفیشنل پروگرام ٹو ڈیولپ اے پروگرام اینڈ ٹو ڈی بگ اے پروگرام ڈی بگ مینس ٹو ٹیک دا بگز آؤٹ ٹو فائنڈ آؤٹ دی پرابلمس ٹو فائنڈ آؤٹ دی ایررس ٹو ریموو دی ایررس سو ان کمپیوٹر سائنس اور ان دا ٹرمس آف پروگرامنگ وی کال اٹ ایز ڈی بگنگ اینڈ فائنلی مینٹینیبلٹی ہو از ریسپانسبل ٹو مینٹین دس پروگرام ان فیوچر از اٹ یو ہو ایز ڈیولپ دا پروگرام دین وین ایور یو ول ہینڈ اوور دس پروگرام ٹو دا اینڈ یوزر یو ول بی ریکوائر ٹو گو دیئر اور یو ول بی ریکوائر ٹو پرووائڈ اٹس مینٹینیبلٹی اٹس مینٹیننس سو وی کال دیٹ دا پروگرامنگ از این انجینئرنگ بیکاز اٹ ریکوائرز اے ٹریڈ آف بٹوین دی اسپیڈ دا سائز ڈیولپمنٹ ٹائم ریکوائرڈ اینڈ دی مینٹینیبلٹی فائنلی is programming an art yes programming is an art because it requires creativity and employ imagination it's really your imagination how this program should be developed what should be the algorithm what should be the procedure so no two person can write the same program every person comes up with his or her own ideas to solve a particular problem so there could be number of problems but it is the imagination of a programmer that he develops or she develops a program so that's why it can be called as art and it is the proper uh, copyright of that person or the property of that person who has developed that particular program Let's talk about the types of programming languages. You will listen this terminology again and again. First generation programming language, second generation programming language, third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation. First generation programming language was a machine language written in zeros and ones. I'll explain it to you in a few minutes. Second generation programming language, we have assigned the name, mnemonics, code assigned, name assigned, abbreviation assigned to these machine codes. So it was a second generation programming language. A third generation programming language is usually the high level language. 
प्रोसीजर ओरिएंटेड और ऑब्जेक्ट ओरिएंटेड फोर्थ जनरेशन इज वेरी हाई लेवल लैंग्वेज आई एक्सप्लेन इट इन फ्यू मिनट्स एंड फिफ्थ जनरेशन प्रोग्रामिंग लैंग्वेज इज ए नेचुरल लैंग्वेज लेट्स डिस्कस द मशीन लैंग्वेज लोएस्ट लेवल ऑफ लैंग्वेज वेरी क्लोज टू द कंप्यूटर in the first generation of computers you were required to tell the computer what to do in a language that could be understood by the computer the instructions were translated into ones and zeros remember i have explained it to you that every cpu every processor has got its own instruction set so in the first stage people used to have a card whenever they were required to instruct the computer they used to take take out the card and read out okay add 110 a into b a is 10 b is 11 so the code becomes 1101110 it was very tedious very difficult <coughs> why ones and zeros because there are computer is a bistable device it has just got two stages two states on and off so it was convenient for the machine but it was very difficult for the programmers for the users so there came assembly language which is a low level language that allows a programmer to use abbreviations that could easily be understood by the user these abbreviations were called mnemonics spelling dekh lijiyega mnemonics thode se different hai spelling pronunciation se the mnemonics are opcode and oprints for example add ax comma bx move cx comma ax increment cx here the instruction part is called opcode or operation code which is add move increment multiply divide go to jump similarly operands operands could be these are the registers ax bx and cx are the registers of the cpu within the cpu you store the data in a register that is again a memory within the cpu very small size memory so we assigned opcode and operands to the ones and zeros sequence and these mnemonics are basically the abbreviations assigned to the sequence of zeros and ones it was an improvement for the user because it was convenient for the user to write the instruction faster instead of writing a code 110101011 so now the programmer can quickly write down add ax comma bx but the drawback the language is specific to a particular processor maine aapko bataya tha na har processor ka har cpu ka एक अपना इंस्ट्रक्शन सेट है फॉर्चुनेटली अनफॉर्चुनेटली मशीन लैंग्वेज इज डिपेंडेंट ऑन दिस इंस्ट्रक्शन सेट सो यू रिक्वायर एन असेंबलर टू ट्रांसलेट असेंबली लैंग्वेज प्रोग्राम इन टू मशीन लैंग्वेज देन कम्स हाई लेवल लैंग्वेजेस इंग्लिश वाइक लैंग्वेज 
refinement of the second generation programming. So it was more convenient to the computer programmers because the notation were familiar. Numbers and abbreviations nahi hai. Notations are just like English keywords, English language keywords. And these high level languages are not machine dependent. So you are not worried that you have to follow a certain instruction set. So it's mean that there is something, some piece of software that translate your high level language program into low level language. And this translator from high level language to low level language is either a compiler or an interpreter. In my next lecture, inshallah, I'll be explaining the difference between the compiler, interpreter and some other related concepts. The languages are Fortran, COBOL, BASIC, C and C++. These are all the high level languages. Basically, these languages were built over and above assembly language. I do remember in 1983, I developed an interpreter, which was basically a basic language like interpreter that facilitated the professors to communicate with the single board computer using this interpreter not only contained the basic language commands, but also it contains the command to manipulate internal parts of the single board computer. We had a microprocessor college in Islamabad where the uh, professors from multiple countries participated. They used this MonBase. I gave it a name, MonBase. They use this mon base to teach IT professional for different exercises to communicate directly with the single board computer. So it's not difficult basically. If you develop the skills of programming, you can write down your own interpreters and own compilers. You can design your own new language. Just to encourage you, I have given this example. Then comes very high level languages called fourth generation languages 4GL. Much more user oriented and allow programmers to develop programs with fewer, fewer commands, less commands as compared to third generation language. These are called non-procedural language. So the programmers don't have to specify all programming log logic and tell the computer what they want and what the computer should do for them. So it saves a lot of time, it's very convenient, very easy to program the computers. This fourth generation languages consist of report generators, query languages, application generators, and interactive database management systems. The examples are RPG, that is a report generator, then SQL, structured query language used by different databases, and then we have few more. Natural languages, fifth generation, like ordinary human language, English language. So programming language that use human language to give people a more natural communication with computers. So you don't require the services of a programmer 
if you have an access to our natural language. But it requires artificial intelligence. It's very difficult to develop such languages. So develop machine to emulate human-like qualities such as learning, reasoning, communicating, seeing and hearing. So these natural languages are developing very slowly as a lot of research work is being done in the artificial intelligence. This is the evolution of programming. I've started it, uh, although I picked up this slide and I've given you the reference in the beginning, but started in uh, 1954 from the Fortran, but over and above this, before Fortran, we have assembly language, and before assembly language, we have machine language. But it started at Fortran, that later developed to Algol. So you can see the development takes place of different languages. Algol language produce multiple languages. We combined the features of the multiple language to produce a new language. So you can see there is uh, from Fortran we have got Algol and from Algol we have got uh, BCPL, then B language, then C language, then the evolution came to C++, then from C we produce object oriented C language which was E and also contains some feature from Smalltalk. From C++ we produced Java and then we combine combined the features of Java and C++ to produce C sharp. So these are the categories which are given below. We have got uh, declarative or imperative or procedural languages. These are different paradigms, programming paradigms. I will discuss it in detail in few minutes. Then we have an object oriented, logical, functional, functional and object oriented and on the left side you will see the years when these languages were launched. So we can see that the previous slide we could see different programming paradigms. These are procedural, imperative programming, functional programming, declarative programming, object-oriented programming, event-driven programming, parallel programming, and few more. But in this particular course, we will start with a procedural, imperative programming language, and will stay within that. The next course you will study object oriented programming. I will give you the introduction of the object oriented programming and maybe in some other time I also would like to explain the functional programming and other programming paradigms. So let's move forward with our procedural and imperative programming. This procedural programming tells the computer what to do. So when we say do this, then do this, then do this, and if xx do this, otherwise do this. So this is imperative. This is procedural. They focus on evaluating expressions and storing the results in memory. I have written here in a variable. I will explain you the difference between a variable and the memory in the next lecture. The most common 
imperative language consists of statements such as suppose a is equal to 10 b is equal to 5 then we say c is equal to a plus b so this is basically the example of an imperative language examples of the imperative languages are assembly language COBOL, Pascal, C and C++. These are all the examples of the imperative language. Where assembly language is a second generation and COBOL, Pascal, C and C++ are the high level languages. Which language is the best language? You cannot say that one particular language is the best. It is basically the application that determines that which language is most suitable. For example, for business-like application, the people prefer COBOL over Fortran, BASIC, C, and Pascal. When the people used to start learning the programming, they used to prefer BASIC language that has got some features which are available in Fortran, in COBOL and other languages and simple and easy to program. For scientific purposes, C has come very late, in a very late stage. Fortran is there from the mid 50s. We had a Fortran, then we had Fortran 4, then we had a Fortran 77, then we had Fortran 90. So the Fortran, Fortran stands for formula translation. It is basically most suited for the scientific programming. So in the scientific and research organization, R&D organization, people used to program the computers using the Fortran language. It was very popular among them. Then came the C language and people started preferring C language as compared to Fortran due to some reasons that I will explain it to you. So the different languages are there. It's up to the end user to select the most suitable and ideal language for their task. But again, it is the choice of the users. People still use Caesar to cut down their lawns when the lawn movers are there. So you cannot really force the people to choose a particular language for one particular task. So let it be the choice of the end users. But what should be the evaluation criteria? I will give you the some suggestions regarding the evaluation criteria. These are not the hard and fast rules to evaluate any particular language. These are just the suggestions. Number one, readability. Meyer's programmer case in reading source code. Your written program should be read by another programmer. It should be readable. So one should be able to pick up the logic, the purpose of that statement or the set of statements you have used. So we call it as that the language should have a readability. Orthogonality include context sensitive restrictions. means how much rules and regulations are applied and how much complexity a language has and how much sensitive it has in the development of the computer program. Applicability. Best tool for the best job. Are you using a COBOL language? for a simulation program, it's not suitable. You can do the simulation in Fortran, you can do the simulation in C, 
So the choice of a COBOL language for a simulation may not be possible or if you are doing it then it might not be very efficient or might not be a good choice. Writability. Include simplicity and orthogonality and support for the abstraction. These are certain technical terms that I promised to explain you in the near future. Reliability includes the type of checking and inspection handling. And finally, the cost. Cost in terms of time cost in terms of uh, resources required so you have to be considerate to f select a particular language and see how much cost it requires. Other are flexibility of control statements and availability of data structures. Again it requires certain explanation that I promise to discuss in the next lecture. So, we have finally selected C language for this particular course which is a general purpose computer programming language. It was developed in 1969 when Dennis Ritchie and uh, Ken Thompson they developed an operating system called Unix. The first version of the Unix was developed in assembly language or some part in Fortran language. It got its popularity. People liked it. So they decided to produce the next version of the Unix. Then they decided that before producing the next version of the Unix, Ken Thompson improved the available interface or available language and produced a language called it as a B language. Obviously it was more convenient and the next version again was very popular among the end users and they realized that they are going to produce a professional operating system. So finally they produced a professional Unix version. But before producing this professional Unix version, they improved the language which was called B language and named it as a C language, which by itself was very popular. It has got different standards. The initial one was called K and R because it was Carnegie and Ritchie who produced the first initial standard in 1978 and these standards were published and people used the language by following these standards published by Carnegie and Ritchie which was called K and R. Around 10 years later, NCC was second C programming language standard which was published in 1989. And finally, ISO certified it and approved another standard which, is, which was published in 1990. The latest standard which seems to be a stable release is called C11. So dear students, with this introduction, I stop here and I think that the fundamental concepts and the introduction to the programming language that I have covered in this lecture will help you out in doing the programming or while communicating with the other IT professionals, other students, vendors, you should be able to use the buzzwords and the terminology that I have introduced you today in this lecture. 
if you have any questions any query please visit the course portal and you can submit your queries over there we would love to answer all the queries you have on this particular lecture thank you very much khuda hafiz